Okay, welcome back. This is Peeling Sid Barrett, episode 20, and this is going to be a big episode. We're going to cover the song Jug Band Blues, and this is episode 20, an interesting number to end up with for Sid Barrett's Pink Floyd career. But we started off our introduction with a discussion of all the complexities that are indicated in the video for the song, including the lighting and the references to literature, etc. in this song. We didn't dig into it too much. We're going to dig into it a lot in this episode. I'm going to start off with a, dis uh, with a quote from Mr. Alexander Pope, or a poem by Mr. Alexander Pope, which is appropriate to the topic instead of Mr. Oscar Wilde. Uh, hopefully that's apparent to you uh, as to the reasons why we would want to use that. This song does, in my opinion, kind of sum up Mr. Barrett, um, not just uh, in his mentality, but also in his, uh, his attitude towards perhaps playing in the band, remaining in the band, or what they were doing. And if you don't really, really dig into this song, it's kind of hard to pick up on a lot of the references. So I want to go through and call out as many references and as, as many possible meanings as they might have Again, you don't know for sure, or, or at least I don't know exactly what Mr. Barrett's trying to relay. Uh, things could be random, etc. But if we can kind of delineate more and more lines of thought and they seem to intersect on certain ideas, then I think it's more plausible that he may have intended them to be there in that way. And perhaps for some reason he was disguising them, perhaps for fun, perhaps because uh, he wanted... To deliberately hide things, as we mentioned in our in our video on Vegetable Man and the painting, Son of Man, uh, people are attracted to things that they don't fully understand or can't see, and perhaps that's deliberate. And of course, writing songs, you want people to enjoy songs, and you want people to listen to songs and think that they apply to them, and the best way to do that is by making them somewhat obscure, so that you're not specifically calling out uh, for example, people's names that they don't know, but perhaps you do. So, let's go ahead and really try and take a, a, a good look at the song Jug Band Blues. Now, in my introduction, I mentioned that uh, Arnold, Arnold Lane, in the Arnold Lane episode, sorry, we, epi we, we kind of mentioned that uh, that song was kind of like a po potato eater's moment for for Mr. Barrett, and in my opinion, this is kind of like his Starry Night moment with the band. Uh, you could even say it's his uh, Wheat Filled with Crows moment for the band, specifically, not necessarily for him. Uh, he's tying together and showing that he has, has grown in many ways and perhaps is ready to leave. It's almost like a great grand goodbye song, and perhaps that's exactly what it was meant to do for the band. So normally in the beginning, what, what I like to do is kind of call out uh, any comments that people have made or corrections to previous episodes. I, I would like to uh, call out one person's comments and um, they mentioned that, uh, and their name is Domine, I believe, they mentioned that there was an episode which could kind of explain why Mr. Barrett uh, was perhaps acting a bit strangely and uh, particularly on the tour in America or in the United States. And a reason for that is that um, he received a shock while, uh, supposedly received a shock while giving a concert at a, a club, I believe it was the Otter Club, but that is kind of called out in uh, Sid Barrett and Pink Floyd, Dark Globe by Julian Palacio. So I'll give you the page number. He he does mention this specific episode or that specific instance, and I I won't get into it too much, but um, he does mention this happening and that Sid had received a shock. Now uh, it appears to be on page I'm going to say 291. So on page 291. Mr. Palacios recounts that story. I won't go into it too much. You'll have to kind of read the book if you want to 
know much about it, but uh, I am aware of that shock happening, but I also am aware that uh, Mr. Barrett was being, um, let's say, non-cooperative previous to that, or there, there are many, many accounts of him being non-cooperative, not playing, etc. I'm not saying that, of course, the shock didn't make things worse, or that we don't know exactly what the shock did to him, if it, if it did indeed happen. But, um, in my opinion, Mr. Barrett already had uh, some issues with the band, so my overall consideration is uh, of the, the work itself, and what perhaps was trying to be relayed in the work, and uh, as much as possible trying to understand what Mr. Barrett's relaying, but if you've ever been shocked, uh, I've been shocked, <laughs> I've known people that have been shocked, it's uh, difficult to explain um, the sensations that go along with that. Uh, obviously there are different levels of getting shocked. Pretty much everyone has played with a, like a 9 volt battery on their tongue and just check and see if it's still <clears throat> active or not, which is of course a very minimal shock, but uh, which, you know, I, I don't know, I, I wouldn't recommend anyone do that, but uh, I know I used to do that when I was a kid. And, of course, when I got older, I also got a shock. And I've been around people that have received shocks. And uh, quite often, people get quite confused. So, I won't say that uh, it didn't have some effect on him. I don't know that it did or it didn't. But uh, they relayed a story, and I'm relaying it to you. And, and I'm going to uh, go ahead and... Uh, reference Mr. Palacios' book again. Uh, I would like to, again, state you know, none of these books have anything to do with me, and I have nothing to do with any of these books other than I enjoy the books, and I own most of them, so I do reference them. But uh, when I discuss books and I discuss these um, pieces of music, a lot of other people are sponsored or they are... Um, uh, I, I don't know if they're pushing products, but I'm not doing that, and I won't do that. I refuse to do that, ever. And of course, that's easy for me to say, because I'm not getting anything currently <laughs> for doing any of these. But I have no intention of doing any of that. So, uh, my opinions stated here are my own, and, and I want to keep it that way. Now, a second thing that I want to discuss is that in a previous episode, I was going back and looking through things, and I'm kind of judging to see if the ratings are appropriate or not. I think I may have been way too conservative with my ratings on my videos, but I, I wanted to be as safe as possible. So, at, at any rate, I went back and I, I was listening to my video on Arnold Lane and Fart and Joy, and something that's very obvious to me now that the Fart and Joy uh, emblem, or the Fart and Joy, uh, I, I'm not sure what you would call that, it's almost, it's almost like a graphic that he made for that uh, collection of artwork, that it's red on blue or blue on red. It didn't occur to me at that time that that's of male-female colors, and that may have been done deliberately. I thought he was just contrasting blue and red, but knowing what more of what I know now, I, I, I look back on that and I think, well, that's pretty obvious and I missed it, that uh, the Pink Floyd could be, uh, and again, now pink is a shade of red, so Pink Floyd and Floyd could be a corruption of boy, the word boy, so, or slang for a boy. So you have there, again, kind of the red and blue contrasting idea tied up in these ideas or these presentations names and creations of art that Mr. Barrett was participating in. Again, not normal. They're very uh, insightful ways of twisting ideas into almost like uh, subcategories of themselves and presenting them in a very new way, which is outstanding to me. So I guess that's pretty much it for the corrections that I wanted to run through and, and the call outs to people. And if you um, want to make any um, comments, please feel free to do so on the videos. That's kind of the point of this is to get people thinking about all these different ideas. 
So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and I will uh, link Jug Band Blues. You can check it out again. Note the lighting again if you if you so desire. And um, perhaps go check out the lyrics or have them up on your phone and while, while I'm running through them. Again, I apologize. I can't use copyrighted material. And lyrics are, of course, copyrighted material. And for some reason, some people are able to post those. And I, I don't totally get why they're able to do that on YouTube. Perhaps they did it before there was some agreement between... YouTube and, and, and bands and stuff, I don't know. But I do know that lyrics are considered to be poetry, and poetry is copyrighted for quite some time. It's creative work. So I won't be posting the lyrics in entirety. I'll just be kind of discussing aspects of the lyrics as we go through this. So go ahead, check out the video, check out the song, and um, I'll, I'll, we'll come back and we'll discuss the video and we'll discuss, uh, we'll discuss the song in depth. All right, hopefully you had a chance to check out Jug Band Blues. So this is going to be big. Uh, it's taken me a while to put this together because I had to summon the energy to tie up all these different topics into one video. And hopefully it'll be worthwhile. So the first thing I want to just, first things I want to discuss is um, we previously discussed the lighting and in our past episodes now, I believe Scream Thy Last Scream, we discussed the artist Gustav Metzger. Now, he does have a relationship with The Who, we discussed that as well, and apparently he also was working in lighting for some of the some of the Who shows. Now, um, I'll, I haven't verified this, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's referenced within Wikipedia, so I'll show you that reference. And it does kind of correspond to what was my line of thought when I saw this, which is they're deliberately using contrasting colors, such as red and green, the same way that a painter does, like Van Gogh, to attack a person's sensibility, to generate uh, sensations of unease when looking at certain people. I will point out that uh, Mr. Barrett's uh, face is lighted in blue, of course. There are blue references in the song. We'll discuss those in a moment. And uh, towards the end of the song, when everything is done, the band is done, everything's kind of sick, and Mr. Barrett goes through his last kind of verse, he's lit normally as if he has become a human, which will be important as we get into the song. Okay. Uh, the rest of the song kind of is, is pretty clear. The, the probably most significant detail I'd like to point out is that it is a very simple song. Supposedly the king of psychedelic rock. We've discussed his use of distortion and uh, wah-wah pedals for previous music. Psychedelic rock and roll, utilizing all these strange sounds. This is an incredibly simple, simple song. And he's... Basically playing it out with an acoustic guitar. And then they add in a whole bunch of weird band noises. You know, the brass band. And there's a whole bunch of stories about all of that. And I don't want to get into that too much and, and weird noises. But it ends up with him just strumming on his guitar acoustically. And giving off his last verse. Which may be what he intended to do. So let's look at the lyrics now, and the lyrics are going to be the key to unwinding not just, I believe, Mr. Uh, what Mr. Barrett was trying to relay in this specific song, but also perhaps what he was trying to relay with the rest of his music. Now the first thing that he mentions is that he's being overly considerate and he mentions how it's considerate for people to think that he's there, and he's obliged them, and they make it clear that he's not here. Okay, so the first thing is, I, I just want to point out, a lot of people believe that he was schizophrenic, and a lot of people have stated that. Again, I'm just going to say we don't know that. I don't know that. I'm not a practicing physician, and I have not personally evaluated him, and I sincerely doubt anyone has. 
Uh, he was, as we mentioned before, he did go to a, a, a kind of like a facility for a while. I believe he was committed by his family. Uh, I, I don't know exactly how that all went down. But I do know that the vast majority of people who are claiming to know do not know. <laughs> they don't know, and I don't know, what his state of mind was. So let's just look at the lyrics themselves and ask the question, why would he be saying that he's not here? Again, if this is a grand goodbye, he could be saying that he is uh, giving thanks to the band and he will no longer be there to some degree. It could be a goodbye. Now, Mr. Palacios, again, I will point out, and this book is a very, as I have previously mentioned, an extremely detailed book. He does break down the very nature of the possible sarcasm that is outlined in the very first two lines. And he also mentions where that may be coming from. So he calls out a previous uh, book called Surrealism in Painting and a writer or a painter, Giorgio de Chiquiro, attacks his critics. And the way he attacks them is by mentioning that he's obliged to them and they were good enough to make it clear, etc., uh, etc., et about his paintings. And this is on page 286 of Mr. Palacios' book. So he has uncovered that to some degree. The very first two lines are, in fact, an attack on critics <clears throat> that are tied to that specific painter. Now, <clears throat> the next two lines about a moon. So there are a few ideas that I want to just present to you here. Now, <clears throat> I've watched this many times, and I'm not convinced that he's saying a moon could be big and a moon could be blue. Uh, I don't want to get into the never knew a moon. Now, th that obviously is the same sound in the mouth, the N and the M. So, N and and never knew moon. <clears throat> so, he's kind of clanging there, again, internal line rhyme. Or, I guess you could say sound consistency. But the most important portion is obviously that a moon could be big and a moon could be blue. And there are very re various reasons why this could be very important. The first thing I want to point out is that I'm not convinced that the second line, he's actually saying moon. And I will also point out that a lot of um, posted lyrics may not be what was intended by the artist. For example, Vegetable Man has some really, really strange versions of lyrics. And I don't know that there is a specific set of lyrics that jive with what he is actually singing. It's such an odd song. But what I do want to say is that the second moon could actually be the word room. And I did look at the video over and over again to see if he's actually mouthing the word moon or room. And I can't tell. So for now, I'm just going to say it's a possibility that the second line, he could be saying that the room is blue. Not that the moon is blue. But let's get back to the idea of a moon. Why is the idea of a moon big? <clears throat> well, the idea of a moon is, is, is big because there are a lot of ideas tied up within the imagery or the symbolism of the moon. And it is really, really hard to go through all of the possible meanings of what a moon actually involves. Now, as we have previously used, I'm going to point to a dictionary of symbols by Mr. Sir Lowe. He attacks the idea of a moon. He mentions that it's tied to the idea of a process. Uh, of course, it's, it's tied to life on Earth. Uh, it's tied to uh, female cycles. It's also tied to dismemberment and uh, possibly the Osiris myth. And there's another mention possibly of the Osiris myth because a moon is uh, goes from full to empty. 
Now they call a, an empty moon a new moon, but of course uh, the idea of being reborn, the sun is reborn every day. Well, a moon is reborn every month. So there's a, there's a, a lunar cycle that is tied up in that. Uh, there are a lot of ideas tied up in the moon um, that it is a connection to sleep obviously because a lot of times people see the moon at night and connect it with the idea of sleep it is uh, therefore the opposite of rational uh, day thought because it is tied up into the ideas of dreaming and irrational thought so there are a lot of ideas that are tied up within the moon now I would also like to point out that uh, there is a tarot card called the moon. Uh, we know that Mr. Barrett was somewhat interested in esoteric thoughts. And uh, the moon itself as a card is a... Uh, I'll, I'll just go through the possible meanings of it as, as defined by the... As defined by the the Rider Waite tarot deck, so the moon they they discuss is tied to the idea of hidden enemies, danger, darkness, terror, uh, mistakes, and error, <clears throat> etc. Now, how they draw those connections, I don't entirely know. Uh, I will point out that the traditional Rider Waite tarot deck moon has what appears to be a fairly feminine face in the moon, which makes sense with two towers. I don't totally understand the two towers and two dogs that are barking at a moon along with a I guess you could call it a crayfish of some kind on the side of a river there are a lot of um, discussions that this is outlining the idea of a path to uh, death so uh, there's kind of like a dismemberment or perhaps not physical death, but uh, an ego form of death, which happens when people dream that they they leave through the waters and um, I guess past two towers. Now there there are mention of of any time I see two towers like this, I, I automatically think of Kabbalah for some reason. I, I don't know if that's the only reference possible, but. Uh, it certainly is possible that there's a form of like a spiritual mystic journey that's tied to the moon and all of this is outlined in in various stories and and cultural beliefs from many different people many different peoples many different uh, cultural ideas and beliefs and I won't go into it too much but I'll just say that the moon could be tied to the idea of being reborn and perhaps doing so in an intuitive way versus a rational way because uh, of course the sun is tied to rationalism etc now the second line is important because uh, something is blue it's either the moon is blue or a room is blue now let's assume that the moon is blue and of course the color blue is tied to many things including the idea of truth a true blue uh, now the sky is blue water the oceans are blue and so blue as a color is often tied to the idea of travel again a possible discussion of, of uh, spiritual travel in this case we're talking about a water cycle symbolically that's understood by people for many many thousands of years it's not a new idea people understood fully well the idea of rain going into the oceans and then coming back out and, and making clouds. That's not something that was just discovered in the last 200 years. So <clears throat> this, this idea of this cycle and this uh, tying together of a vertical progression or traveling, a vertical traveling of blue could of course um, be tied to the idea of a person's soul traveling. Or progressing through whatever cycle it's supposed to there also is a tie uh, per mr. Serlo between the color blue 
and uh, the the connection between Jupiter and Juno. I don't totally understand this because in 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 my in my understanding Jupiter was tied to the color red so I'm a little bit confused about this but let me just give you a line or two blue is the attribute of Jupiter and Juno as God and goddess of heaven there again is another God and goddess reference it stands for religious feeling devotion and innocence uh, perhaps the color blue doesn't necessarily refer to Juno, uh, Jupiter, but to the relationship between Jupiter and Juno as, uh, as a proper marriage of some kind, or the marriage between those two stations. So there's a lot of ideas there and a lot tied up in the idea of a moon. I would like to point out one other thing that I learned that might be interesting to some people and that there is a ancient tarot card for the moon which does in fact show a young man playing a guitar outside of a woman's window. The crayfish in the water motif is still there. Obviously a lot of artists have drawn upon things or sensations or feelings or the unconscious mind for inspiration and uh, in this card the person is playing next to two dogs and there is a woman who is blonde with short hair by a window which is of course as we have already noted uh, possibly tied to someone or something specifically in Mr. Barrett's past so I don't know if that's going on but I, I will just point out that there again is the idea of a blonde He's already discussed uh, that, and he will continue to do so in his song, Golden Hair. So let's uh, go ahead and move on to the idea that this could possibly be referencing a room that is blue. And the reason why that is important is, um, well, real quick, before I move on, I just want to point out one thing. Uh, it is possible that the idea of blue and moon could also be pointing to the idea of a moon being big and blue because it's it's running through or in conjunction with Jupiter. So the moon and Jupiter conjunction has very specific meanings. Um, and you can go look those up if you like. I'm not some kind of astrology person. Uh, expert, so I don't totally get it, but I just want to point out that we've tied blue to the conjunction uh, or to the conjunction of Jupiter and Juno, and the moon here is blue. So if Mr. Barrett was into astrology, he may be referencing that the moon is in Jupiter and or conjuncting with Jupiter. Why he would do that, I'm not entirely certain. I do believe that Mr. Barrett was born in January and. Uh, I'll go ahead and give whatever that uh, sign of astrology is. And he's not the only one. So we're going to come back to this idea. There is someone else that's very important in this era that was born very close to when Mr. Barrett was born. And we're going to come back to that. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and discuss what a blue room could be. And I would just like to point out that there is a very famous Picasso painting that is of a blue room. And the blue period in Mr. Picasso's life is important because it's when he left his old life and he moved to Paris to start a new life as, as an artist. Uh, he was leaving his security. He was leaving his sources of support and starting a whole new life. And so if Mr. Barrett is referencing that a room could be so blue, he may be saying that he's entering a new form of his life as Picasso did. Okay, so next line is he's grateful that his old shoes are thrown away. We've already discussed the shoe references in Vegetable Man and what that could be discussing. Now again, shoes could reference uh, who a person used to be or what, 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 what path they were walking previously in their life. 
And the next most important line is that he's brought in here instead dressed in red. So instead in red, obviously in line rhyming, but he's also using dressed specifically as a poet. There are many ways to say that someone is in red. Uh, they could be garbed in red, but he has specifically chosen the word dressed in red. And I would like to point that out because we're going to come back to that again later on. Why would someone be dressed in red? Uh, there are a lot of reasons why someone would be dressed in red. Now, the first thing that I think of, of course, uh, well, there's two cultures that dress someone in red. Uh, one, I believe, is a wedding tradition of dressing in red, but that, I believe, is for women to dress in red. Uh, the other one is that there are significant people in history who have been dressed in red to some degree. Now, one of them, of course, was Julius Caesar, who had a, a kind of like a red cloak of some sort that he often wore, or cape, I suppose you could call it. Uh, there also was a famous Italian, uh, Garibaldi, I believe, who wore red. Uh, it appears to be somewhat of an Italian tradition, but their associations with the color red tie in with various things. So, <clears throat> and you can't completely disassociate this, uh, at least in Garibaldi's case, with uh, perhaps his religious background. So, let's discuss Caesar. There are two famous paintings that I would like to point to. One is by um, Lionel Royer of Vercingetorix throwing down his weapons, painted in 1852. This painting shows Caesar in his uh, red cloak. And a second painting is of Caesar, 1875, by Adolphe Yvonne, which is uh, a which is important because it is a painting that shows Caesar um, in the act of writing over a woman, and that woman very likely represents the Rubicon River. Now this would indicate, now the first one obviously is Vercingetorix, it's about uh, his war with the Gauls and um, subjugation of those people. The second painting here of Caesar is uh, pointing to him crossing the Rubicon and basically destroying the, re destroying the Republic, essentially. He's turning his own army it, an, an army is not allowed to cross the Rubicon. If you're not familiar with the Roman Republic, uh, there were areas of Roman territory that did not allow military. They had their own uh, Roman, uh, I guess you could call it like a, a public military to defend Rome. It was, it was loyal to the Senate. And in, in my understanding, it was loyal to the Senate. And it was against the law for any general or any leader to bring their, their army within the confines of Rome, and th those were defined, I believe, to the north by the, by the Rubicon River. So, in doing so, basically Caesar has turned traitor and has decided that he will overthrow, overthrow the Republic. He will enter a new life, and in doing so, <clears throat> he will have to cast off who he used to be and his previous associations, and he will have to move on in his own way. So, perhaps that's why he, a, a reference to Julius Caesar may be made uh, dressed in red. Now, the Romans also had a, a, a... We have previously mentioned that in the song Butterfly, Mr. Barrett references Latin, screaming the name in Latin. So we know that he is somewhat interested in history. He may be making a reference to the Roman tradition of a triumph, in which case uh, a person wore red shoes and apparently had their face painted red and wore a purple cloak of royalty. So perhaps he's saying that he's being given a triumph in a way by being allowed to uh, participate in the song and, and give his grand goodbye. So all of those ideas may be kind of tied up in the idea of red, this idea of being a red 
champion, a red king, of course, of some of some kind may be referenced here. I will also point out that it is possible that a, a second or third meaning of red could be tied up in the idea of a sacrifice. Of course, red is tied in with the idea of blood. And in a way, by saying that something is dressed in red, perhaps it's a reference to something being sacrificed. In this case, it would be himself. Perhaps he's saying that he is being sacrificed for some purpose or who he previously was is going to be sacrificed for some purpose. Now, obviously, if you're if you're knowledgeable with Pink Floyd, you know that the character of Sid Barrett is utilized in uh, various forms for The Wall, the, the movie The Wall, for the album. There are so many references to him uh, within that within that album uh, that it really is, in a way, I guess you could say. Uh, using or offering up the uh, memories of Mr. Barrett. Uh, you could also argue that his influences uh, run through quite a few of the albums like Dark Side of the Moon and Wish We Were Here. Whether that's uh, tied to this idea of being dressed in red, whether it was kind of understood or planned by Mr. Barrett that his likeness would be used uh, or his previous self would be used as a as a form of inspiration and it would be offered up in a way as a sacrifice to attain something as in to attain some form of inspiration etc uh, metaphorically speaking uh, he could be making that statement there and that indicates of course that he may have already been thinking in that direction at in 1967 which again asks the question about uh, previous previous uh, statements within a song like Chapter 24. I would like to point out also that the astrological symbol uh, looks like the number 24 for uh, Jupiter, and perhaps he's tying that he's interested in it graphically. Perhaps he recognizes. The number 24 and then he connected that with 24 the I Ching I don't know but it is an interesting kind of a connection so uh, let's go ahead then and look at the next line now in the next line he mentions that he was wondering who could be writing the song so <clears throat> now people that believe he had a schizophrenic breakdown and uh, there are a lot of uh, ideas tied to schizophrenia I'll, I'll link a a kind of a record of a painter who unfortunately i believe ended up committing suicide who was schizophrenic and painted a number of self-portraits and his name was charnley i believe so i'll give his information and i'll link a video on him that i found to be somewhat interesting so maybe you will enjoy that i don't know but <clears throat> again i'll just state that we don't know for sure what exactly is going on within Mr. Barrett. So who could be writing this song? I would like to point out that he does seem to ask a set of rhetorical questions at the end of the song. This may be the first of a rhetorical question set. So perhaps he's not wondering, but he's positing the question to us to say we should be wondering who is writing this song. Not only perhaps this song, but these songs. <clears throat> because this song doesn't specifically say uh, that he's wondering who could be writing Jug Band Blues. <laughs> he's just saying that he's wondering who could be writing a song. He does say this song, of course, but uh, the, imp the implied uh, connection is, of course, that you're listening to this song at the time that you asked that question but you could be listening to another song and asking the same question. All right, next he goes into the idea of not caring if the sun doesn't shine. The sun is, of course, a very complicated, uh, complex symbol. Uh, Rider Waite ties it to uh, a number of things, those being uh, uh, material happiness, 
fortunate marriage, contentment, or happiness in general. Obviously, the, the sun shining on you in life means uh, that you're having a great time and things are going really well. So perhaps he's uh, stating that he doesn't care about those specific things. He does state in the next line that he doesn't care if he owns anything. And that right there ties directly in with the Rider weight um, meaning of material happiness. In other words, having the things that you want in life. He specifically says right there that he doesn't care if he has things, which appears to be related to the, the idea of the sun uh, symbolism. The next line is that he doesn't care about being nervous with a person who he is, who that is, he doesn't say. And he mentions doing love in the winter. Now, uh, we have previously mentioned people that that might be involved with. We've also previously mentioned this idea of winter. And the idea of winter, of course, is was discussed in our previous episode on um, where we discussed Sylvia Platt and her poetry and also in the subterraneans. So those, of course, are loaded with, uh, with that reference and may be tied not only uh, by him to an idea, but also to specific people and places that he may have known at those times. In other words, uh, he may have uh, read the subterraneans and shared it with certain people, so he may be referencing that. There's no way of knowing for sure. The last lines now, he mentions that the sea is not green. We've already discussed that being a reference to James Joyce and the sea being snot green. Okay, so snot and is snot green is kind of a joke. It's a little bit funny and it shows a wicked bit of wit, I would say. He states there that he loves the queen, who he could be referencing again. We're not entirely certain, but there is another queen reference. And of course, we already mentioned Jupiter and Juno. And perhaps again, he's making a king and queen reference. He mentions what is a dream. Uh, we've already uh, tied the idea of Midsummer Night's Dream to previous music. And what is a joke? So uh, there's a lot in this. Now the joke thing, I, I think he could be referencing, of course, the idea of perhaps being famous or perhaps being in a band or being a pop musician. He could be referencing the play Midsummer Night's Dream, which started out as kind of playing a joke on people. So uh, he may be trying to capture some of those ideas. He may be capturing all of them. I really don't know. But I do have a general generally strong sensation that he is in a very Sid Barrett way relaying a group of collected and loosely connected ideas that are meant to convey a feeling and the feeling that I get is of course that this is a great goodbye and it's uh, perhaps a decision that he has made and he's going to move on to some new form of relationship. Perhaps he believed he would be writing songs with the band and eventually he was just completely pushed out. Uh, perhaps he went on to continue to write songs with the band and he was never credited. I don't know. Again, I'll ask the very practical question because I'm a fairly practical person. How does someone who's under contract and very likely in debt to people that have paid for things like trips, and trips to the United States for touring and all these other things, how are they simply released? Why are men like Roger Waters and David Gilmour working with him in the future to help produce his music? Uh, obviously the music company or some music company believed that he was still of value and they wanted to participate in the development of his music and there would have been some kind of a business agreement for that and it would have been formal it would have been a contract and Mr. Barrett did get royalties for quite some time. So if he's getting royalties and perhaps, you know, they're made out to Sid Barrett and he can't cash them, I don't know, because the bank doesn't recognize him and he doesn't have an ID that says he's Sid Barrett, but he's Roger Barrett. Uh, perhaps there's some kind of financial wiggling going on, but I do know that people can't simply just walk away from a deal specifically when you're talking about very, very large sums of money. 
It's not that easy of a thing to do. So <clears throat> we've broken down Jug Band Blues now. And I would just like to point out that it takes an incredible mind to weave all of these things into a into a garment. A garment that captures so many ideas and perhaps relays what is in the mind of Mr. Barrett. And I would also like to relay that I don't really feel like this is an overly negative song. It's a critical song, of course, uh, or at least the words appear to be. But in my mind, this is Mr. Barrett casting off who he used to be and going back to being perhaps a human, which is perhaps why the lighting at the end of the video shows him in his natural light. Perhaps he's decided to go live his own life in his own way. Now, there is an artist that I would like to relay that is somewhat loosely related to these ideas. And his name is Marcel Duchamp. Now, Marcel Duchamp is famous, I guess, for two things. Uh, and I'll relay a few other facts about this man's life and try to explain why he was important. Now, of course, uh, he was very important in this era, the 50s and 60s. And um, for two bits of work. Now, the first is uh, Mr. Duchamp, when he started, was kind of affiliated with the Cubist school. And he made a wonderful painting titled New Descending a Staircase. And I won't show the whole thing, of course, because it's a relatively new painting. And all I want to discuss or show is the movement of a person's legs traveling down a staircase. It is a wonderful painting. It delivers the idea of motion and the range of motion of a body, of a person moving. And I think it's uh, quite ingenious. Now, Mr. Duchamp was also a very understated man. and He was, he was quite a genius in his delivery. He was taken to later in his career using very average everyday objects, which he did with his uh, with his display entitled Fountain. Eventually he moved completely out of painting. The Cubists were not entirely happy with his uh, nude descending a staircase and they asked him to remove his display and he decided well he wasn't going to be a part of their movement anymore pretty much. Which is uh, I guess kind of a fitting response to someone who wants to live a an artistic detached life from influence and simply to relay ideas that they find to be interesting or perhaps ideas that generate um, I don't know inspiration in themselves and in other people. Now his fountain is uh, derogatory in a large degree. It's kind of funny it's simply a urinal that's placed on its side and displayed as a fountain and titled our mutt, etc. Now, there are a lot of possible explanations for this, but he did remove himself entirely from the, faint, uh, from the painting group at the height, kind of, of his recognition as a good painter or as a great painter. And he went on to start to simply arrange everyday objects. And uh, he had a word for that, and I can't remember exactly what it is off the top of my head. But uh, it's kind of like reconfiguring or something like that. I can't remember the term that he used. But he came up with a number of very interesting combinations of very average, everyday objects that are organized in an artistic way, but perhaps are not artistic, or not intrinsically artistic. It's almost like an anti-art form. And he finished his career kind of with a the idea or a painting of... Um, I'm going to say looking through... Looking through a kind of a wall at someone. And uh, this person is kind of laid out in... I'm going to say, view through the door of the installation, uh, 
given one, the waterfall, the illuminating gas, etc. I'm not entirely certain how to call that out, but but basically there is almost like just like a peephole in a brick wall and you can view a body that's lying in a field of uh, flowers with the building in the distance, etc. And of course you have to immediately consider the idea of separation from viewer and what they're viewing and of course that also ties in with the idea of Pink Floyd's later album and movie The Wall which is basically tied to the idea of separation between a person and themselves and between people one another etc but that uh, that idea was was contained in Mr. Duchamp's display. So, I guess uh, you could say uh, one other thing I'd like to discuss about Mr. Duchamp is he he did basically leave public society for a very long time. He became kind of a, a recluse of sorts and just worked on his own ideas. So. We have covered a lot in this episode. I hope it was interesting, and I hope possibly that this helped to kind of give people an idea of what Mr. Barrett may have been planning and relaying in this song. And of course, recognize to some degree the implications of what this meant for the band and what this may have meant for himself as well. That's pretty much it for this episode. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you haven't subscribed yet, um, I'll ask that you go ahead and like, share, subscribe. I have to decide what I'm going to do now. So I think what I'll do is I'll discuss uh, influences of Mr. Barrett and what those influences would be. I don't know. A part of me really feels strongly that uh, Mr. Barrett went ahead to work with other people. And I'll get into that later on. Or at least it's a possibility. I have no doubt that he was a very influential person. So I think what I'll do is I'll put together uh, a series that consists of his solo work, not in entirety, but just the songs that are ones that I think are relaying important ideas or connected to other things. And then I'll also try to call out some of the influences or perhaps people that he may have been working with. And I'll also discuss some of his artwork. And that's kind of my plan going ahead. I don't know how farther that that'll go, but uh, so long as you know some some people are enjoying it, then I'll I'll keep putting these out. So that's all for today. Talk to you later.